Mondo. Looking for the ocean. We watch everything Pixar ever made. That's features, short films, tech demos, and more. I'm Danny Vincent, and as always, I'm joined by Mark Young. Mark, Wahoo. how hey. are you doing today? I have COVID. You did a very good Chris Pratt impression right before that, just so you know. What? When you went, Wahoo, that's what Chris Pratt says. When Sorry, I know you want me to Wahoo. stop talking about Chris Pratt, but... <laughs> I don't care about... I mean, whatever. No, but I, you, just I was making a Mario a joke. Guy. I was making a Mario joke where he goes... Remember how, like, the trailer, the first trailer came out, and he was like, Wahoo, Mushroom Kingdom, here we come. And, like, someone, like, oh. matched up that audio with the mom from Bob's Burgers, and everyone was like, yep, oh, that's who he sounds like. I don't remember that at all. I remember watching the Mario trailer and thinking that people were being unfairly mean to his voice performance because it sounded fine. Like, yeah. it doesn't sound like the thing that you just did. I know. I will whatever. actually say that um, I I watched Mario since the last time we recorded, and I won't drop my Mario take here. Like you know, I won't drop the full take, but I do People think like couldn't the, handle it. The Chris Pratt hate. I mean, you can name him for other reasons, but I think he is definitely one of the better voice actors, like celebrity voice actors, working. Because after a while, I just didn't hear him in the role, which is like the ideal for someone like Chris Pratt. You know, the issue with Mario talking is that Mario just shouldn't talk, right? It doesn't matter who they cast in that role. It would have been weird to hear Mario talk excessively no matter what. It's just Mario should be a I silent character. I don't think that's true. Mario has a classic voice. I think we're used to hearing him talk. I don't think we were used to him talking full sentences. I think we're used to a wahoo or a here we go or mamma mia. Not going like... We gotta find Bowser so we can go to... Well, no, sorry. We gotta find Donkey Kong so we can rec recruit the Kong army so we can stop Bowser. I don't think Mario has ever said something that long. <laughs> like, well, I never... think Bob Hoskins has, like, prepared us. And, I've of never course, seen it wouldn't be, like... That. I never have either. Oh. But I just... I'm, I'm just... I'm just saying I'm sure there's a way to do it. There are issues in the movie that I don't think Pratt was a problem. I, I was just saying I agree if you having seen the final product and I think people overblew it. But anyway, we're here yeah. to talk about Pixar, the real Pixar, animation studio. Pixar, here to talk about two short films. We are here to talk about Bernie and Partly Cloudy. Yep. Bernie is, of course, the Blu-ray short of Wally. I didn't actually have a chance to read up on its production, but I remember at the time being told... I think by like the intro that this was a, this was a running joke we had in the movie that we had to cut from it. I don't know the truth to that. There's nothing on Wikipedia that says that. Um, but yeah, that was always the impression I had. It's probably but, a lie. Yeah. Something like that. probably something to like sell the kids on it. Like yeah, this is basically a deleted scene we made for you. But well, I, I don't see why not. I mean, some of that I'm sure could be a deleted scene. Like when Bernie is smacking his head against the door. I think that would be a fine thing to make and then cut. Well, I will say, before we talk about... I gotta introduce the other thing we're gonna talk about, even though we're gonna talk about Bernie first, presumably. But the other thing we, we watched was Partly Cloudy, which is the short film that played in front of Up. It's about mm -hmm. storks, which is a topic about that will, storks. will be returning on this podcast at some point. I don't know if it's this year or next year, but we'll be back to the storks at some point. Um, yeah. But so, Bernie, I gotta tell you... Oh, well, you go, when, go, go. Go. Well, when we when I watched these two shorts a few days ago, I was pretty positive on them, and then when I watched them today, and maybe it's because I'm horribly ill, I was pretty sour about both of them. Ah, uh, yeah. I feel like as someone who never like I always come on because I'm so familiar with most of these shorts and these films that I will watch it. I'll I, if it's a movie, I'll watch it the night before, and then we'll come on and talk about it. If it's a short. I will watch it right before this and be like, all right, I'm ready to go. Here I am. I feel like if I had done what you do and like watch it, say, like on Friday and then rewatch it today, I think the same thing would have happened. I think both of them are things that get like, well, okay, Bernie gets like the like the gentleman's three. Like the, it's a three out of five. I don't hate it. Don't love it. But it's fine. It does what it's meant to do, right? That's that's what Bernie's to me. I think partly cloudy is a bit better. I think partly cloudy gets the three point five, which is a uh, yeah. It's, I enjoyed this. It was nice. Um, I think it's a little mm -hmm. too. What's the word for it? I don't want to say trite or convenient, 
But I do think it kind of wraps itself up a little too neatly because I remember at the very beginning thinking like, oh, why why is this being able to make football? That's dumb. What, what baby wants a football? And then at the end it's like, ah, oh, okay, it was to set up the ending. Um, but, yeah, like... Well, they set that up, well, yeah. Well, but like I was like, I, I, I think they're both solid. I think partly cloudy, a little bit better, but they're both solid. Mm-hmm. I think Bernie, I have more a clear way to break down what I don't like about it. They're both just very pleasant, and I don't think pleasant has a long shelf life <laughs> for me. I just, well, I watched these, and I was like, all right, I'm done. Never need to see these again. Uh, Bernie, so I guess we should talk about Bernie first. Meet Sanders. What? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. we, had, we had to make the joke at some point, okay? We, we talked about him on we the We really Simpsons had movie. to. It's a great joke, and I'm glad we made it. Yeah. Alright, um, <laughs> moving on. We made any, it. We're done. We're done with the anyway, Bernie Sanders jokes. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's about the character Bernie, who is a welding robot, who is fixing that light spire on the side of the ship what that you see when Wally flies outside of the ship. I forget which is the exact shot that appears in the movie, but it's the one where he's like outside and then Wally and Eve fly back inside after the dance scene and then they shut the door behind him and then you see that this welding robot is trapped on the outside of the ship. And so this short is about that robot and his struggle to repair this light. And we see the supply robot that he gets things from, we see him try and fail a few times, and then we eventually see him get back to Earth. Spoiler alert, I don't know why I had like, we have to give a spoiler alert for this short. I mean, um, it, it takes it place concurrently gets... with Wally. Like, it ends where Wally ends, so like, it's not even a spoiler. I mean, we got to this point in the podcast and you haven't watched Wally. Why are you mm-hmm. here? <laughs> like... Everyone should just just watch Wally. Yeah, really. Um, but they get back to Earth and then he fixes the light thing, but then he doesn't really fix it and then the short ends. All and right. I thought there was some really nice moments of like quiet humor in the short. I appreciated the repetition of watching him go down the hallway. But in in the end this just yeah, not much else going on there. I think my problem with this short is goes back to Wally. And one of my big things I praise about Wally in our Wally episode, which was I was so taken aback rewatching it and being like, oh dang, yeah, these robots are robots. They're all Wally is special because he's been like evolving for seven hundred years, but everyone else in this movie acts exactly how they're programmed, and the people who are programmed to be like quirky are that way because they're meant to interface with humans. And that's why I like Wally. And then this comes in, and it's like, this is a welding maintenance robot with another maintenance robot. And they already have these quirks that they like singing songs, and they get frustrated and get embarrassed. And I'm like, eh. It's it's something where it's like, if I... It, but it's also one of those things where it's like, Wally is such a great work. And even though this is part of that project, it's also so clearly a side project. That it's like, I can't really even, like... It just... It's like something that irks me. It doesn't ruin the short. It's like, ah, I wish they'd found a way to do this where it followed along with how Wally works as a film and that world works instead of just basically having, what if we had this guy get stuck outside the ship? And also, like, I think Wally is really smart in how it, like, it, one, one thing that bothers, like, I hate to be like, cinema, this is very cinema to me, to me, but it's also like, one bit at the end of the short is like he's holding onto the side of the ship. It's like you're in space. There is no gravity. There's no reason for this to be going on right now. Um, oh well, that I mean that's as old as the Wally movie. They've had gravity since then, so not on the outside I kind of, the ship. of accept that. Not on the, not on the outside of the ship. The outside of the ship is very good about keeping it like there is no gravity outside the ship. And oh, well. in the short up to that point. Bernie is attached to like those treads so I'm like okay you know like I just assume that's how it works so mm. that's a, I mean but again it's something where it's like I feel like very like grab a lot this doesn't follow the science that Wally put forth that makes it bad yeah. and it's like that's I don't really feel like that's fair because again I was like I still enjoyed watching this it's just all this was in the back of my head while I was watching it you know yeah I, th- I think that's kind of my issue with this short too is that it feels like it can break a lot of rules and Partly Cloudy is kind of like that, too. We'll get into that. But it's just, like, the short really creates some questions in the back of your mind while you're watching it that I found kind of distracting. But, 
it has some good gags. I was think we were talking about Buster Keaton before coming on here. I don't know if any of that got recorded, but it's interesting watching a film where I think the best gags are silent instead of being based on like giant stunts or movement okay. or anything like that. Okay, I'm glad you clarified. Go on, go on. Go on. Yeah, like, every you show know, we watch you know is I mean. quiet. Every... <laughs> okay, I, get, I get hear what you're saying now. Okay. Well, they're, they're, like most of the jokes are based on stillness and on cuts rather than like a character doing some action or something like that. Yeah, I my other thought was, again, I don't... Maybe the Pixar wiki will have this instead of normal Wikipedia, but... I do remember saying at the time, they tried this little song like, yeah, these are deleted scenes that we just couldn't work in the film. Um, which feels like bullshit in the same way Jack-Jack Attack does. But in that regard, I kept thinking that like if this was integrated in the film, the way to end it would be like he gets sent to the, like after the second try and getting back in, like he, he welds his way back in, right? You have him all his way back in, mm-hmm. and he gets sent to the repair people because he messed with the ship, and then that's how he'd be in the third act. Also, I feel like that that fix is something where Andrew Stanton might have thought about him, and like, even again, sub- subscribing to this myth that we don't know if it's true or not, it might be me misremembering something like my conspiracy theory of Lilo Stitch, but <laughs> I shouldn't say something like that and leave it hanging. But anyway, what? I was like, I have a cons- I I feel like everyone okay. I'll get back to Vernon. I feel like everyone in the world should subscribe to one conspiracy theory. Like a harmless media conspiracy theory. I have my mine is Lilo and Stitch. Which is that I firmly believe they edited the film from theatrical release to home release. Even though I saw it in theaters when I was seven, so I'm going off of seven year old Danny's memories here. But I think it's a good conspiracy theory to have, which is I believe that they edited the end of the film. When was the last time you saw Lilo and Stitch, Mark? It's, it's in the been news. forever. Why do you think this? So, okay. So, the end of Lilo and Stitch. In the version we have all can watch in Disney+, Plus, it ends with, you know, Stitch goes like, This is my family. It's a little unbroken, but still good. Yeah, still good. That's my Stitch impression. It's pretty okay. I'm going to listen back to it in my car the next like the next week and be like, Damn, that was terrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why would you put that no, in? No, that was solid, but what, what is your conspiracy? Okay, so it's that, that scene, right? And the Grand Council woman's like, All right, you can keep Stitch... Yes, you're now under protection of the Galactic Alliance, blah, blah, blah. And then she says to Jumbo and Peekly, don't let these guys get on my ship. And then at the end of the movie, the ship takes off. Jumbo and Peekly are stranded there. Credits roll. We get to see the future of Lilo and Stitch. Great ending. I firmly believe that in the theatrical cut of the movie, Gantu, which is the giant blubbery whale alien for people who are not Lilo and Stitch affanciados like I am, was left behind with Jumbo and Peekly because he also fails in the third act of that movie. The difference is he's coded as bad guy, so we don't necessarily care. I mean, Jumbo and Peekly are too, but they're funny bad guys, right? So we don't care about them mm-hmm. as much. But I firmly remember the, him being left on Earth at the end. And the thing I remember specifically is that in the credits, when they're showing the future of Leland Stitch, there's a shot of them at Thanksgiving dinner. I remember Gantu being the one to cut the turkey in that like family photo. Now, if you watch on Disney+, Plus, it's Cobra Bubbles. And I believe they changed it on the DVD because in the time between the movie being released in theaters and the DVD coming out at home, this is my conspiracy theory, they were already working on the TV show. They're like, we need a film for the TV show. Just make it Gantu. We'll change the ending of it so he's in space at the end of the movie and no one will notice. This is my one conspiracy theory Hmm. I allow myself to have. Well, people, if you believe this or if you have any information, let Danny know. So yeah. we can see if it's like, that's it's true. The, it's the um, what, what should I tell his conspiracy theory? Um, the Gantu problem. I think that that'd be the way to go with it. The Gantu problem. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know. We can think about that. Uh, the problem <laughs> seems a little bit generic. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be named for Gantu in some way. Anyway, it could be named for Gantu. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so what's your Bernie conspiracy? <sighs> well, no, the Bernie conspiracy is like you know, was this part of the film or not? Was this designed to be part of the film or not? Oh, well, I think the answer is just yes and no. Like, surely some of it was, and then other parts of it weren't, and that's it. But it's something where, as I said, like, the way to fix it would be to... He joins the rebel robots at the end. But I think it's something where Andrew Stanton would come to the conclusion of, well, I could fix this dumb bit, or I could just cut the dumb bit and not worry about it. Or have it just be mm-hmm. there for the quick gag of, 
Wally and Eve coming in. You know? I think you cut him because you don't need another character who's kind of like Mo. That's yeah. my big issue with the short is that this I don't get why this is not a Mo short, but I guess it has a little more of an arc because it can be about a character who has to interact with a lot of other characters besides yeah, unlike Mo who's kind of off doing his own thing. So I guess maybe that would be why, but that was always my issue with this short, is that I always think it's a Mo short, and then it's a Bernie short. Why don't we have a Mo short? I don't know. Honestly, they shouldn't... Like, we already said, like, the ideal sequel to Wally is the credits, but I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't have had... Because I think the most interesting part of this short and how it relates to Wally is the end, where all the robots are just sitting outside the ship, and he's like, I fixed this useless ship, and it's like, the ship breaks anyway, and it's like... It really hits home that, like, what are these robots going to do about their directive now? Because they're designed to be for that ship. And, of course, we see in the credits of Wally, like, they adapt, right? They adapt to be able to help, like, fish and stuff. But I would be mm -hmm. interested to see, like, we don't need to see it for Wally or Eve, but that's what the Mo short should have been about, you know? Like, make a Mo short about what is his what is his place in the new, the new world order. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the new world. What is his place in Earth society? Mm -hmm. And that would have been an interesting yeah. way to go about it. I don't know. I think part of my deal with this short, too, and this is me maybe wanting it to be something that it's just never going to be, is I just don't... I, I'm i not super concerned about what the robots are going to get up to because if they're robots, like, they'll be fine. I think it's interesting. It's, it's, I, I get what you're saying, and maybe I shouldn't go so hard on you because I know you're, you're sick, but the whole point of Wally is that you're supposed to care about these robots as much as the humans. Well, no, I care <laughs> about them. It's just they don't really have like anything that's gonna kill them you know they've been running everything and wally's been there and i think the robots will be fine i think my i, th I don't know i feel like my pitch for mo was good I, I i i don't mean to defend this pitch i just came up with but it's like mo's entire directive is get rid of like dirty earth things and then he lands on earth <laughs> like how does mo continue with life i don't know well he'll be he'll clean but he'll, he'll be cleaning dirt that can't be clean. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's intriguing. How does he achieve Zen? Ooh, we should look up... Uh, I'm going to look this up really quick, because this might be fun. And maybe maybe, maybe it won't be. Maybe I'll just find a bunch of like disturbing things I don't want to know that exist. But I'm going to look up Wally fan fiction. Very quickly. I don't <laughs> think that's a wise thing to do. <laughs> Mark's going to be like, Danny, I'll just cut it out. I, I don't wanna... know what... What could you possibly hope to find? I, I'm just curious. All right. Oh, you're right. That was not a not a good decision. <laughs> I found one fan fiction in the entire well, archive of our own. It's rated mature. It's an auto times mo. Okay. Never mind. The, Never mind. Well, I like good. that pairing. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I, I, I'm like... C's rated M auto times Mo. Okay, I'm good. X out. I don't need to read anything else on that. <laughs> right. I've so well I wanna ask you, I don't think I don't actually know if I saw this short before we watched it for the this show. And so I don't really have any like associations associations with it. And I also think if we're going to talk about, like, subtle animation humor, I can think of so many other examples that mean so much more to me. Do you have any, like, connections with the Bernie short? Not really, honest. Like, see, I, I think I said this before, is that once we get to Ratatouille and Wally, -E, I get the DVDs and Blu-rays, but I don't really dig into them the way I did when I was a kid. So I think I watched Bernie once, I was like, okay, and then... And also, remember, I'm a big fan of Presta. And Presta was on the same DVD. So if I was going to watch a short, I was going to click Presta. I wasn't going to pick this after the first time I watched it. Um, mm -hmm. I will say, actually, though, if you're curious, and if you think this is a very boring topic, you can be, Danny, that's boring. I forgot to mention in our Wally episode, like, you know, I talked about the packaging of the Wally Criterion, but I didn't talk about, like, the menus on the DVD, <laughs> which I think is interesting because. The, I actually didn't realize this until today because I wanted to watch it on the Blu-ray because I was like, well, I have it anyway. 
the Wally Criterion comes with two Blu-rays. It comes with a bonus feature Blu-ray and like the feature Blu-ray, and they have different like the feature Blu-ray is set on Earth, where like it just takes you through Wally's world, like you know his um, you know his um, little house, but also just like the world of the the trash mm-hmm. mountains. That's what I was thinking, trash mountains. Sorry, but then the mm-hmm. other one is like it takes you through the Axiom. It's just like a nice little smooth like we're going up to the captain's now. Oh, we're on the deck. You know, it's like ah, oh, nice. I wish I could remember how the Wally um, original Blu-ray looked, but again, it was in that really bad sleeving that was eco-friendly, which was great, but it also ruined the movie, you mm-hmm. know, very easily. I'm surprised because I don't think about Criterion releases having like really complicated DVD menus. Well, it 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 is probably the less complicated than what the Disney ones were, because the Disney ones are always like, you know, you click scene selection, it's like, all right, let's zoom in here, we get the scene selection, whereas the Criterion one is just like. Basically, like a screensaver, set to the Thomas yeah. Newman score. Well, do you have any other thoughts about Bernie? Uh, one thing I was curious on that I would have done if I had more, t- if I had known I had it, because I would have watched this earlier, and like, because I, I assumed it was just you know what Disney Plus had was what the Criterion had, but the Criterion has you can watch the entire short as a storyboard. I was like that would have been interesting to do. I feel like, hmm. um, but I didn't. <laughs> so. Um, well, that's cool to know if people want to get the Criterion version and watch it as a storyboard. Yeah, I always think those are interesting, because we did the entire episode on, well, not the episode, but we mentioned the Luxo Jr. pencil test and the Luxo Jr. Mm-hmm. episode we did, so I think it's cool to have that. I do think, to transition a bit to our next topic, we'd also mention here is that it's interesting we're doing Bernie and Partly Cloudy together, because these are actually Pixar's last movie, and their next movie is that Angus McLean kind of bummed around Pixar for a bit. He did a couple of the Toy Story shorts we'll eventually cover. Um, but then he did his feature debut last year of Lightyear. And then Partly Cloudy is from the director who's doing Elemental. Which I actually think is very interesting in regards to Partly Cloudy because, you know, I don't know if you saw the most recent Elemental trailer, but there are... Cloud- I haven't seen a Elemental trailer. Oh, well, there are characters... So, Elemental, for the listeners who might not know, who aren't like me, who's like, ah, Pixar movie, I'm so excited... Let's ch- the people who might be st- just you know like coming along with the ride. You know, I assume there's a decent chunk. Of I, I feel like most of the people who listen to this are pro Pixar. Well, no, they might be pro Pixar, but they're not going to be like, ah, new Elemental trailers out. I gotta watch that right now. You know, that's all I'm saying. But you know, it's about like these characters that are like earth, wind, fire, and water. You know, that's what Elemental's about. And the wind characters are represented kind of like how the clouds are represented and partly cloudy. Um, which I thought was just interesting. Like, the art style. Cause it's something where I feel like you don't necessarily notice the Pixar art style sh- shifts until pretty, like, probably 2015, 2016. But I think having seen the trailers for Elemental and then seeing how the clubs look in Partly Cloudy, I'm like, oh, okay, this character is designed like how this guy likes to design his characters. Mm-hmm. But it only became evident now... However many years later, 2023, you know, like, that, like, yeah. okay, well, and, and, this is how this guy likes his characters to look. And didn't he design, well, not design, he directed The Good Dinosaur? Yes, but The Good Dino is this whole, and we'll get into this when we talk about Good Dino. Good Dino is such a mess of a production. Like, I know we said Ratatouille was Brad Bird taking over, but Brad Bird had, like, two years to crack Ratatouille. Good Dino, if I remember right, he came on, like, a year before and the director like the former director stayed at Pixar and I think he still had a hand in things but it was like one of those things where it's like can't change too much because he's still here and he still likes working you know what I mean like you might ask mm. this guy to come in and fix it but it's kind of hard for you to completely make it in your vision in that mm-hmm. time frame and with the guy still on board to help out like it's story because it's yeah. going to be like oh this is what I conceived you know I, I actually yeah. honestly I should definitely when we get to good dino I definitely should do a deep dive on the production and read on it before I come on because mm-hmm. I've never really done that and I assume there's a lot of politicking there in a way that even like Brave and the other replacements did not have. But So yes. partly cloudy. Yes. It's about storks delivering babies and where the storks get the babies, the clouds make them, and a lot of the clouds are nice sunny clouds and they make pretty babies. And then there's one cloud who's a storm cloud, and he makes evil babies. And there's a crocodile and porcupines and that sort of thing. I enjoy Partly Cloudy. I think it's a very clever premise. 
And by that, I don't mean like, oh, storks are being like, you know, whatever, clouds. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Sure. I think the idea of being like, what does the stork who has to deliver the, like, the natural predator of the stork's animal (laughs) babies do? I think that is a good premise. (laughs) And I Mm -hmm. think it does, it it doesn't overstay its welcome. It doesn't, I think, I think it does like three animals total, like for the jokes. And it's like, okay, yeah. good. We don't we don't stay here too long in this short. It's a clever enough idea I can give like, yeah, you get you get credit for. Cuz it's like I also think it's I think the relationship between the cloud and the stork is interesting cuz they're like coworkers, which I know is that's literally like Pixar's entire like and he's like the interesting thing between these two things would be interesting if they were coworkers. That's literally like how they come up with that for ideas. But um yeah. but I do think it's like it's an interesting thing where it's like I think when the cloud starts crying at the end, I'm a little like, all right, calm down. This is a little stupid, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I I think it's it's nice. It's definitely a little little kiddish compared to some of their other stuff, but I enjoy it. I like yeah. I I like how those characters are. As I said, I like how they kind of don't really have a morality to them. You know, they're just people who go to work. They're not evil. Mm-hmm. They're like you know what I mean. They're not good. They're, they're not bad. Immoral. They just are. They just. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just like you said, it's so, it's like this simple little fable about, like, friends, and, I don't know, I'm really bothered by the timeline of Partly Cloudy, because, of course, you can just say that all this happens over time, and, you know, maybe none of this really matters but it bothers me that they make it seem like they've been doing this for a long time and only now is it being a pro- becoming a problem like there is no inciting incident that the suddenly creates a problem is society yeah well kind of but like society has always been there so like that's why i'm annoyed by the ending is like well, yeah, why didn't you just, like, figure this out before? It's the same It's the same thing with Presto, where I just wish they had just... I am like, much more sympathetic where... to your opinion here than on Presto, to be clear. I, that wasn't what I was... I just rolled my eyes on camera, so that's, like, that's not what that was about. <laughs> but sorry, go on. Well, just <laughs> that, like, this, this short seems like the beginning of this idea, and the whole short seems to be like playing around with this beginning of an idea but i would love to go a little further and say like well what's it like if he's you know already got the football equipment which is how the short ends the stork gets some football equipment to help him uh carry the babies that are going to hurt him it's also i don't like i get i yeah, I mean, like, I, I can't disagree. I think that it's one of these shorts where it's, like, I think the premise is really smart, and then it kind of should be a feature. Or at least they should they should try to figure out a way to make it a feature. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, they never will, because there's another movie that... An animated movie that was... One of, one of the big animated bombs of the 2010s is a movie about storks. So I don't think anyone will ever be touching this idea ever again. Um... Mm-hmm. But I well, I it's also like already it is it's kind of like already the the idea that starts Dumbo, like you have the normal storks delivering good babies, and then you have the kind of wacky stork that delivers Dumbo, and that's so fair. it's all there Dumbo already. So, long. so you're mm-hmm. right. I I look at this and I think more about the the stork myth which i'm curious maybe i got something i'll do research on when we cover storks i'm curious does the stork myth originate from dumbo or is that something that's been like around longer than that that is it does not originate from dumbo but i'll look up where it comes from because i'll be honest i think that is a myth that is dead i know because okay because i feel like there are a lot of people who will say stuff like like actually, I'll give you an example that I talked to you about over text, but I'll sum it up for the listeners. Is 
um, I someone commented on my letterbox review for the Polar Express and was like, I think you're wrong. I think this is a Christmas classic. And I was like, I disagree because none of the kids I work with ever talk about this movie at Christmas, which I know is anecdotal evidence. But the fact is, if I work with 60 f- children at the minimum, right, and not a single one of them talks to me at Christmas about how they're watching the Polar Express, whereas they talk to me about like, oh, I'm watching Elf, oh, I'm watching Home Alone, or I'm watching The Grinch, you know? Or I'm watching Charlie Brown. In fact, the Polar Express has never once been brought up to me in the five years I've worked with kids. That to me means that this movie is not being passed down. And all this to say is like, I think the stork myth is kind of extinct among kids because whenever kids like have like you know their parents have babies now it's like they're like oh yeah mom's pregnant you know even if it's like a kindergartner there's no idea of like let's hide it from these kids or like make a joke out of it there's no which is probably the reason why storks bombed (laughs) it's because i I don't think i think it's this very old-fashioned idea of like oh we can't talk about like we can't have um people sleeping on the same bed on i love lucy Mm -hmm. like now it's like who cares like mom how's he gonna explain mom getting like you know a belly you know <laughs> like when she's pregnant yeah. <laughs> it's like you'll just tell her she's pregnant <laughs> apparently <laughs> the, the, kid. the stork myth is very old ancient greek old it might have been confused with a pelican um i wasn't able to find like first uses or anything like that off my quick google search but it does not originate with dumbo okay good but I would agree now that you've mentioned it that I do think the part where it's like, oh, it's the drunk stork that carries Dumbo, right? Isn't it like the drunk, st- isn't it like a drunk stork in Dumbo? He's kind of drunk. I forget. I don't, I've, I've gotten so bad at characterizing outsider characters because like life has taught me not to. So I'm just <laughs> like, this person's like this, this person's like that everyone's basically the same, right? It's made me very bad at film analysis, but yeah. Do you want... Because you actually led me into it. Do you want my Galaxy Bring Tate from the Zemeckis retrospective? Sure. Danny saw a Zemeckis retrospective. I have seen every single... In the last week, I've watched every single Robert Zemeckis movie. With the exception of Castaway, which I plan on watching as soon as we finish recording here. Um, So if you want my Castaway take, I'm sorry. I got a migraine, so I missed Castaway and Allied. So I watched Mm. Allied last night, and I'm going to watch Castaway tonight. But anyway, um, my Galaxy Bring take is... This entire entire festival, the guys running the festival introduce every movie, and they keep going. Every movie they go like, "Please come to Welcome to Morrowind. That's gonna blow your mind. It's gonna connect all the dots." And I saw Welcome to Morrowind, and someone asked me, "Well, how was it?" And my response was, "I sent the gift from It's Always Sunny Philadelphia of Danny DeVito going, oh my god, I get it.' Um, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is that my Galaxy Brain take is." It didn't come from when I watched Marvin, because I watched Marvin on Monday. On Wednesday, when I watched Forrest Gump, I was like, holy shit, these are like the exact same movie. <laughs> these are... hmm. The difference is, is that Marwin is much more critical of how the main character treats its women, whereas Forrest Gump is always just kind of like... I think most people take away from Forrest Gump is, wow, Jenny, she's awful. And watching Forrest... I, I'm always someone who watches these movies that, like, have these criticism from, like, the 2000s and 90s where they're like, this woman character is awful. I always watch it. I'm always like... I don't... Like, because I remember in our Spider-Man, my my Why Is With Time Dan, when we did Spider-Man 2 and 3, I was always like, I think Mary Jane is completely in the right in these movies. Everyone always, like, likes to complain about how Mary Jane is written in those movies, but I think everything she does is valid. It's just as a child, you watch it and you immediately are going to be like, why is she being mean to Spider-Man? Um, I feel the same with Forrest Gump. Mm-hmm. I think she might do some questionable things, but she's clearly got like a bad backstory. Anyway, my Galaxy Brain take is I, I'm not here to talk about every Zemeckis movie. I, what I want to say is is that even though I do think Forrest Gump is a better film than Marwin, I think Welcome to Marwin kind of proves that if Forrest Gump came out today, not only would it get discourse to death, but I think most people would see it and just be like, what? Because <laughs> I really was watching Forrest Gump and I was like, I don't... I don't understand why this was a hit. It's a very weird movie. <laughs> hmm. Really? So, like, what is... What? I haven't seen Welcome to Marwin in so long. I'm so surprised you saw Welcome to Marwin, honestly. But I was like, ah, I get Marwin now. I don't, the, I don't the, remember why. They're both what? about, like, outsider protagonists who are judged by those around them. And the movie treats them with a lot of empathy, even though it also recognizes that they're 
not perfect human beings. The difference is with Forrest Gump is that I don't know. That's not the way I want to put it. I think Forrest Gump. I think it treats Forrest Gump with kid gloves. So I think Forrest does get off with a lot of stuff easy in Forrest Gump that because it's like oh it made a joke oh it's funny whereas Marwin always like leaves Steve Carell to like pick up the pieces of his idiocy. It was funny because the guy the guys at the fest were like. Flight also is kind of this type of movie, but I think Flight, obviously, since it's got Denzel in the lead as an alcoholic who we cut, I feel like we view alcoholism as, like, an acceptable, like, problem, if you know what I mean, in movies, compared to, like, oh, it's a mentally handicapped person, or, oh, it's a guy with a shoe fetish, which, again, that's, like, the weirdest thing about Marvel is that it's, like, this $100 million movie that, like, empathizes with that, I feel like. I think that that was the most radical thing to me about it. It It's like, oh, my God, like... This movie does not judge him at all for that, and that is really cool. And also, like, I imagine the Paramount exec, exec sitting in like the screen of it, going like, "How do we market this? How will we make our money back? What did we do?" And then Zemeckis was probably like, "No, if you watch the documentary, I'm just just being accurate to the man." And it's like, "Yes, but what? How do we market this?" Mm-hmm. But. No, that's my I would my love God. to watch Flight. Flight if, was good. Every time I try to start Flight, I have a really great time, and then it gets too much in into the story of like the woman that he falls in love with. Yeah, she's and the I, worst part. I hate her. She's the, also, I'm, and I don't like. I don't hate her. I just think she's like poorly written, and it's kind of like Jesus Christ. You just my, like open up your book of stock characters to like give him a love interest. My funny story with her is that the, I was watching the movie and I just cannot place the actor at all. I'm like, who is she? And then halfway through, she goes home with Denzel. She puts her hair up and it hits me. It's Bryce Dallas Howard. And I, I go the rest of the movie and I'm like, yeah, she's doing a really great job. Credits roll. It's Kelly Riley. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I was just like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was so mad. I was like, come on. Um... Mm-hmm. I don't know. My other, my other hot Zemeckis take is, which isn't even a take, it's just I think he's a good filmmaker. I think I watched all of his movies. I dislike four of them. And two of them are The Witches and Pinocchio. Mm-hmm. And the uh, and a Crystal. So three, three of witches. them are like... What? I didn't know that he did The Witches. He did The New Witches. The HBO Max yeah. Witches. Yeah. Not, I had not, no idea. I have, so did I've, you like Used Cars? Used Cars was good. Used cards mm-hmm. though was the one that was the very last one, so I was kind of tired when I was watching it. But I also like the end of it. I was kind of like, "This is Fury Road." Didn't did I text you about my? You watched Used Cars, right? You've seen it. I've never seen it. I've just heard a lot about. Oh, it. Oh, well, I told you my thing where it's like the main the main villain of it reminded me of Fuchs from Barry, and his name the character was Fuchs, and I was just like, I. I am convinced Bill Hader likes this movie, which wouldn't be a surprise because it's like a beloved cult comedy. It'd be mm-hmm. kind of weird if Bill Hader saw it and was like, I didn't like it. <laughs> you know, that, that'd be kind of weird to me. He usually yeah. has good taste. <laughs> um, yeah. But, well, I know, anyway, go, part- it's good stuff. Next time, if we if we want to at some point, although maybe not next time to a guest, maybe I'll drop my Zebeckis ranking. Maybe. Mm-hmm. We'll see. Sorry. Partly cloudy. Ah, partly cloudy. Anyway, so about the Dumbo thing, I just think that the way it appears in Dumbo, that's about as much Dumbo. mileage Sorry. as you're going to get out of that ob- observation. What? I was just like, Zemeckis didn't direct Dumbo, that was Tim Burton. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, R.I.P. to Tim Burton and Dumbo. Um, but I just think that's kind of a gag, and there's not much else to be done with it. So, I do think yeah. the ending is just kind of like, yeah, I think you're right, it does kind of just end. It sets up at the beginning. I, I, I said this at the very beginning of our episode before we talk about Parley Cloudy. It's like, you see the ones that are making the other um, babies, and one of them, like, makes the human one... The one who makes the human baby gives the baby a football, which I just thought was so bizarre, and then, of course, it's to set up the football gear at the end. But mm-hmm. it's like... Until the ending comes around, you're just kind of like, why, why wasn't it a rattle or something, you know? <laughs> like, why, why was it a football? Why didn't it just, like, give it a baby thing? Yeah, I think that too, whether it's because of what you said, the, the myth is dead, or it's just a me thing, I found this short just preposterous all the way through, and I don't know, maybe 
maybe I need to be more accepting if it's like, oh yeah, this is the stork myth of delivering babies or whatever. But I just was like, I I don't care about this. I will also say, I think a big mistake this makes is it plays the ending as dramatic rather than funny. Um, mm. I think this thing is an idea in search of jokes, if that makes sense. Because um, mm. most of the gags are just, oh, the, the stork got hurt by the animal. And then at the end it's like, the, the humor just comes from the playing out of the premise which Mm -hmm. in a way is ideal but also leaves it feeling kind of sparse i did want to do a little bit of um well two things about partly cloudy i want to mention before uh, because i don't i feel like we are wrapping up even though i know this will probably be like our shortest episode ever it won't be our shortest episode but it will be close which is fine you know yeah you're sick anyway so we have an excuse but i did notice when i loaded up disney plus that I, I assume you watched this there. It says contains tobacco depictions, so I was looking for them and I did yeah, not. Yeah, where are the tobacco depictions? Where was it? Well, yeah, like I, I was like, I was expecting one of the class to be like smoking a cigar, or even like, like you know, is it that because like the it gets electrocuted and there's smoke coming out of it at the end of the store? What was the tobacco depiction? <laughs> I wonder if it was, like, in the background of the first shot where they're delivering the babies and, like, someone's smoking, but that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's so. just, I'm, just, I'm just like, what? Where was it? The other thing I wanted to say, I, well, I want to, you know, sometimes it's a little annoying to be, like, cinema Cine, but sometimes I think it can be fun to, like, po- try to poke at the logic here, which is I want mm-hmm. to ask, presuming that, the, well, either... This is a metaphor. We want to. I review this short as a metaphor. We want to view it as this is a world where storks do indeed deliver babies to people who are expecting children. What happens to the shark mom who didn't get her who didn't get her baby? <laughs> Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a fair <laughs> question. I don't know. Yeah, you know, this, 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 that's just something I want to present. Is. That, that that to me was actually the thing that stuck with me the most as it ended. It was like, but what about the shark mom? <laughs> like... Mm-hmm. I think I messaged you about this. I finally looked up the Pixar Spark Shorts. Yeah. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, the par- Spark Shorts. We will get to them probably next year. I, I don't expect we'll get to them this year. But yeah. Go on. Well, I'm just, I just wanted to say for everyone, while we're kind of like bopping along here through these shorts, which are like fine and whatever, I watched the Spark Shorts the other day and everyone should go watch pearl and out if you have access to them i also pearl is, pearl I also is amazing s- out is is very enjoyable out is good i think my favorite of them and this is a basic choice i think it might it, i think it's the only spark shirt to be oscar nominated is kipple i really like kipple oh i didn't watch that one kipple's good and then burrow burrow is really nice burrow's i think the only spark shirt i've seen in that theater because it was nominated for animated... That was also nominated for animated short. So I guess Kipple and... So I, I guess I've seen Kipple and Burrow in theaters. Burrow's, Burrow and Kipple are done with traditional animation. Which is kind of cool to see Pixar experiment with. Like, there's no CGI mm-hmm. in either of those shorts. So, it's pretty yeah. neat to look at. Well, the Spark I shorts will be very... Just... I, I look forward to when we get to the Spark shorts. We won't do a Mater thing where we do, like, four of them in a... We'll do maybe two at a time, like we'll do for the normal shirts. We won't be being like, well, they put up four of them in a day, so we'll do all four today. No, we'll we'll, we'll save the Spark shirts a bit, because there's a lot to talk about, I think, in each of them. Even even the bad ones have stuff to talk about. Man. Yeah, I just was thinking about that in relation to these, because these don't really present you with difficult questions the way the Spark shorts do. So I'm just saying to anyone, if they're watching along here and they're like oh i'll take six minutes to watch rewatch partly cloudy or whatever and then you're disappointed by partly cloudy or you love it whatever just go check out the sparks shorts the, it is it was like breath of fresh air to my eyes i will say uh looking ahead at the main the, what i would call the mainline shorts pretty much just bow for ones i really like that and that's like the last one Mm. Although, I remember liking Lou a lot at the time, but I've only seen it once because it was Cars 3, which I don't like. And then, mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll talk about Piper a lot. Because people yeah. love talking about Piper. Do you have any final thoughts? Not really. We can be short. I want to go watch Castaway. <laughs> and, and cool. I know you're sick, so... Let's all go watch Castaway. It's on Hulu. 
I was very relieved to see it's easily available to stream after I missed it. Hell yeah. It was really right. actually a bummer. I'm not going to lie. Sorry, I will say this and we can give awards afterwards. But the fact that my migraine came on during the one-off showing of Castaway got me really upset because it was like the big one I hadn't seen. So the fact that I had to mm-hmm. walk out of Castaway, like the the ones that Mecca said everyone loves that I hadn't seen, I was like, come on. Like, mm-hmm. but also it was like, I'm not going to sit through this so I have a headache and hate it. Even though like this is supposed to be like one of his best, right? So yeah. Well, but. very curious to see your Zemeckis ranking. I will say right now, After there definitely um, there's definitely an easy top two where it's be like literally you could ask me today, I'd give you one answer as my favorite. The next day, I'd tell you a different one. Mm-hmm. It's very. Which are they? Can we know? How about you guess? Because I actually think it's the easiest answer possible. That's that's my hint. It is the uh. easiest answer possible. <laughs> Is I mean, is it Back to the Future? Yeah. And then I can't think of what the other one would be because I'm. You've been pretty critical of Forrest Gump on this episode. Well, I'll give, the hint I'll give you is the hint I gave my dad when he was trying to guess yesterday. I said that they share a, a main actor in them, so it's one of the main actors in Back to the Future. Back to the Future Two? No, it's not a sequel. Oh. I think um, three is better than two. By the way. Well, I don't know. I can't think of anything. Who framed Roger Rabbit? Oh, that's right. I forget yeah. that he's he has directed so many great movies. He has. He really like that was the whole thing is like leaving it. It's like even like even the walk, right? The walk. This mm-hmm. is my okay. The last take I'm going to give on Zemeckis until we eventually do all my rankings, which I will be next week or probably the week after because I don't know if a guest will want to be there for that. Um, mm-hmm. But oh yeah, our next thing is a guest, is a guest. recording. So um, gonna watch. Up. Jesus Christ. So I anyway. watched The Walk. I rewatched The Walk. Because I saw The Walk at college in 3D when it was playing at the AMC. Because that was one of those movies that's designed for 3D. And the music box does not have 3D screening, capa- screening capabilities. And a part of, like, first half of The Walk, I'm like, this sucks because it's obviously designed for 3D. The cinematography looks terrible and it's not in 3D, blah, blah, blah. But then the ending of The Walk comes around and the, kind of like the whole point of The Walk. Have you seen The Walk? It's no. not that great. It's a, it's, a, it's a three out of five. The ending is what saves it. Um, but it eventually reveals itself to be about how, like, the main character views... You know what it's about, right? Yeah. Okay. So the main character views that his walk across the Twin Towers is going to be the, one of the greatest pieces of art ever. Or at least in his field. Which is mm-hmm. probably pretty accurate in terms of, like, tightrope walking. Walking across the Twin Towers is a pretty staggering achievement. Yeah. Um, but it ends up being this thing about how intangible art is something you can cher- you have to cherish the memory of, but you can't really... It doesn't last forever inherently. And then the end of the movie is like, I got a lifetime pass to this, the Twin Towers to view the observation deck. I, I'm, like, I can go up there as, like, forever. And like, the, it just is very... Like, I'm getting chills talking about it now. And it's like, the entire point of this thing is that it's not just art in the sense of, like he's putting on a show it's like every piece of art will eventually fade away so you have to mm-hmm. find some joy in it at the time and proud pride in it at the time and it relates that to the twin towers and the loss of the twin towers in a really like beautiful way and the reason i bring all this mm-hmm. up and what made this entire experience moving to me is like in this last 10 minutes where it hammers home this point i have the realization that i'm not watching it in the formats intended to and i never will avail- be able to again probably because it's a film that bombed and it's not like they're doing 3D repertory screenings of movies that bombed. So it's like, mm-hmm. I will never see this movie that was designed and is really great in the format it's meant to. Even now, like, even if, like, the fact that this is showing at a repertory retrospective of Zemeckis with literally only 10 people in the theater. It is by far the least attended film I went to. And it's like... You're never going to see, mm-hmm. like, what you want out of this. You're not even going to get it from this. And I was like, this is very moving to me. Like, it's a film about the experience I'm watching it right now. And the fact mm-hmm. that I'm missing something from it. I thought it was just yeah. genuinely very powerful. All right. One last Zemeckis bit, and then I will close it up. I Because I told you, I had one other th- one thing I wanted to say well, about I, I like hearing Zemeckis bits. Is that the guys there who are running it, they, they've talked to Zemeckis. The reason Zemeckis didn't come is actually because he's filming in Link- London right now, which was a bummer to them. Because it's like he would have, he's like, yeah, I would definitely. I think he would have showed up because he had the fact. I think this is like the first like 
retrospective of his work that includes like everything right other than like a mm-hmm. christmas carol the witches and pinocchio like you know like the fact that they're showing the walk is kind of crazy <laughs> yeah but so they take a picture of back to the future of the crowd okay and they're like, we're saying this is a Mechas to show how everyone came out to this movie. And then Contact, mm-hmm. I think I told you, surprisingly, Contact was pretty close to sold out or sold out. It was very... Contact, Roger Rabbit, and Back to the Future all incredibly packed. The other two make sense. Contact, not so much. Even though I do think Contact kind of has, like, the reputation of being, like, the Zemeckis no one has seen but everyone means to see. Mm-hmm. Um, so they take you a picture... Do you agree with that? I should go see Contact? Yeah, Contact. Contact's great. Contact is, I think... One of the, so I gave Back to the Future and Roger Rabbit five stars. I gave Contact and another one four and a half. And we'll see if Castaway joins it later. But so they take a picture at Contact of the crowded audience and they send it to Zemeckis. My thought on that was yes, it's cool, but I think Zemeckis would have preferred. This is just me. Maybe maybe I shouldn't speak for Robert Zemeckis, but I think if I was Robert Zemeckis, yes, it's cool. I sold out a crowd of Contact, but you know would have been better. Would have been recording the crowd of 60 people at Welcome to Marwin all applauding the end of it. I think that would have meant so much more to me as an artist. Mm. <laughs> that this movie that everyone hated at the time was at this retrospective and it looks like a majority of like, not a packed crowd, but a, like a packed for a welcome. Like the fact that Marwin had 60 people at it and The Walk had five people at it, right? Like mm-hmm. that meant people showed, people did show up for Marwin. People were curious yeah. about it. And the fact that most people seem to have actually enjoyed it is like, to me, that would have meant so much. I mean, a, a crowd coming out for Contact and Back to the Future is cool too. But I would have definitely recorded that applause at the end for Zemeckis. Yeah. I think that would have been, I think that would have been more special than anything else. Mm-hmm. But whatever. Well, they'll have to do it again. <laughs> Bring him in for a Marwin retrospective. Bring him, Marwin oh. turns uh, five <laughs> this December. Show it again. Bring Zemeckis. Mm-hmm. Um. Honestly, that is a movie I would want to pick his brain on. Because it is very... Mm-hmm. Well, it's also, you don't know where to start. <laughs> it's such an interesting film. Um, mm. But anyway. Um, All right. So are we supposed to give these wanna... movies stuff? Yeah. You never did. I, I forget what I... I had some idea about what I wanted to give it earlier. Um, well, I know what I'll give it. I, I For the both of these... For the both of these films, I'll give them, like one of the baby porcupines because they, I feel middling about them both so I want to give them the gift of new life as well as some some a spiny animal alright so I'm going to give each of them different things because they're different shorts um, Bernie I, I know exactly <laughs> that was meant to be attack I know it sounds like it but it's not it's not um, Bernie I know very much what I'm going to give it which is um, I remember and I'm sure you've seen other people, but I remember very specifically at my job, um, there was a coworker of mine um, who's no longer working with us. Um, that they quit. It's not like it's not like they're no longer mm-hmm. with us. You know, they they left. The, they're at a better job now. Whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But I remember it's the person I worked with during the pods. Um, the, the pods are. Um, I shouldn't just say that with people like being like, what the, what the hell is that? During the pandemic, we were in pods, air quotes, with like five kids, right? So it was two adults mm-hmm. with like five or six kids, and we just basically watched them while their parents went to work, and they were on Zoom at school. The kids. So, mm-hmm. obviously, both of us have a lot of downtime at this job because it's like the kids are just in class, and we're actually allowed to have our, like our laptops with us so we can do dumb. Not we we can't like watch Netflix or anything, but we can like work on other stuff while we're there with the kids. Mm-hmm. And I remember their laptop had a Bernie Sanders sticker on it. And I always thought that was so... Because well, it, it's not like anyone's going to tell... Especially during the pandemic. Everyone's going to be like, you can't have that sticker, that political sticker on your laptop. But it's mm-hmm. like... It always, I always thought about it because it's like, you know... Kid, like, we get a Trumper kid in here like being like, Bernie Sanders? Like, you know, like... that. That's a that's something that could happen, right? Um, but anyway, I'm going to give Bernie the Bernie Sanders sticker that was on my coworker's laptop. Because <laughs> I think it'd be a nice accessory for him. And it'd help everyone cool. remember his name. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> partly cloudy. Uh, I'll give it a Blu ray copy. Uh, sorry, a DVD. Co- I think it shouldn't be a Blu ray copy. It's a DVD copy of Storks so it can remind itself of director Doug Sleetland, who made the better Pixar short film Presto. Uh, mm. And a oh, better take on the Storks mythos, in my opinion, too. 
that's something I wanted to mention about the Bernie short is I'm so glad that it uses the Bernie name on the robot as the title card, which Wally doesn't, and that is my that's... biggest that's my personal biggest strike against Wally is that it shows us a Wally title card instead of the name Wally on him. I remember distinctly thinking when we were rewatching Wally, even though I obviously mentioned in our episode, it's like, you know, it, it gives you the zoom in on it starts on like Wally's chest and it's like okay that's the title and then it gives you that card i'm like this shot if the music like rising like if there wasn't a top card here it'd just be cool if like we had this like moment of like where we see the grand scope of this and it was just the music playing but no we gotta have the Mm -hmm. dumb wally logo in the middle of the screen because they don't trust us enough (laughs) but oh well Uh, so what are we doing next time all right next time we just went for another big one yeah with wally we went down to earth now we're going up with balloons. We're doing up with a special guest who I would announce the name of, but I'm realizing now I actually don't know her last name. So, <laughs> so <laughs> wow. it'll be a fun time. It's um, it's my friend Tessa who I play D and D with. This will actually be only the second time I see her. I see her because we play D and D with our cameras off. Mm. The only other time I've seen her was at the reading of Maria Kent, where I believe she played. <laughs> Actually, oh my gosh! Then I've she seen played. Her, but she I... played um, your fiance in the reading, if I remember right. <laughs> the person Wasn't I played a your kid. You played the brother. You played the brother. The brother has a yeah. fiance. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You, she played your fiance. Were, I remembered them as being much younger. Well, but... it was written for for well, it was written Maybe for high schoolers, why. and then it was given to middle schoolers. <laughs> right? Yeah. So. <laughs> Oh, I, I well. In any case, I have something to tell you about that too, but I can tell you off mic after. But yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. Cool. Up we're doing time. up. Oh, oh, we got to read the, the credits. <laughs> um. <laughs> All right. Looking for the ocean. It's produced by Mark Young and Danny Vincent. This show is edited by Mark Young. Original artwork designed by Sarah Knopf. You can follow us on social media at Facebook at Looking for the Ocean, Instagram at Looking for the Ocean Pod, and Twitter at Pixar Journey. Where I will tell you right now, we are not verified. Good for us, right? Um, you yeah, we're special. At, <laughs> yeah. You can also go to our website, lookingfortheoceanpixar.podbean.com. You could follow me on markyoungperformer.com. And that has my socials. I'm also at mymyounginsta. I'm posting there. I cooked something recently. I'm posting all kinds of cooking stuff on Instagram. I really need to get back on Instagram. I keep getting, like, the push notifications of, like, people I haven't talked to but I've been meaning to reconnect with where it's like, oh, here they go, you know, great. But, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Mark's frozen right now, but I'm going to continue anyway, and hopefully he comes back in the middle of me logging off. But you can follow me. Danny at Blank Mints on Letterboxd for all my takes on all the movies. You will if you go there, because um, I plan on putting it up whenever I put up my Castaway log, which might not actually be up yet, but it will be up soon if not. Um, if you want my, a spoiler of my Zemeckis rankings, will eventually go through. Those will be up once I finish Castaway. But anyway, you can also listen to my other podcast, the Snow Club, where we talk about the movies that have the most Oscar noms and no wins. And um, we'll see you next time. Think. We're going down to the ground. I finished my I finished Did the walk finish off it? by the way. Alright. <laughs>